All right. Why don't you go ahead and find your way back to your seat as we begin our service this morning. We worship our God for who he is and we'll sing together, crown him with many crowns. You know, the, the goodness of God, the glory of God, his mercy and his love can be observed through so many different things when we look around. They can be observed through nature, in the vastness of space, or providential circumstances in our life, how good God is to us. But scripture is clear that the most evident and the most clear representation are the way that we can observe the goodness and the glory of God is through Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says this, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So as we come on a Sunday morning to proclaim the goodness of God, to bring him glory, it makes sense that everything that we do is centered around Jesus Christ and the gospel. It's evident in Pastor Eddie's sermons, and I think it should be evident in the songs that we sing as well. So we're going to introduce a new song this morning. Uh, it's called, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And as it's important that we, we sing these truths and we proclaim them, I'm going to invite you that if you know the song, please go ahead and sing with us and join and just sing the great truths that are found in it. But if you don't, we're going to sing it actually at the end of the sermon as well. So as we proclaim these truths, I think it's very important that we know what we sing. We're not just singing to entertain ourselves for the first 15 minutes before the sermon. We're singing to sing of the goodness of God, to bring him glory, and to sing the truths of the gospel, proclaim it to ourselves and to those around us, and in turn bringing God the glory. So again, I would encourage you, if you know the song, just sing with us. And if you don't, just take some time to read the words so you can proclaim the great truths uh, that are found in this song. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift 
of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus.
Children's Church, you are dismissed. Morning Pathway. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're going to take a break going through our study of the Gospel of John, and uh, I've had an incredible time just going through it and just all the different truths that have been brought to us through that Gospel. But this morning and for the next few weeks, I really want us to focus in our hearts and our minds on the cross. To really contemplate what took place on Calvary. And to see where we are at in that journey. There's so much happening around us at any given time. We're inundated with news, the media, everything that's going on. Family, work, school, you name it. And I think it's really easy to lose sight of what is really important in our lives. Within all the chaos, our priorities can become blurred. We can easily become distracted. What we hold as truth, it can, be, it can become convoluted. And the way we see things may not be the way they really are. 
And this problem is compounded by a culture that has been quite successful in infiltrating the church and replacing the biblical gospel with this consumer-friendly counterfeit. How many of you remember the Burger King motto back in the 80s and 90s? It transformed the entire, the entire way that commercials were brought to the American people. Burger King, have it what? Your way. You want extra pickles? Fine, you should be able to get them. You want no onion on your hamburger? You don't have to just pick up the bun and take it off. We'll make it that way for you. Extra cheese? No problem. And the message was simple. We cater to the customer. We want what you want because we want you happy. Because what happens to a happy customer? They come back, right? Happy customers come back. And it was a brilliant marketing campaign. Have it your way. But sadly, around the same time, the American church started adopting this campaign as well. It became the centerpiece of their marketing strategy. Give the people what they want. Flow with the tides of culture and become as appealing as possible. And they will come. They'll all come. Church service is too long? Shorten it up. Adjust the message to make it seeker friendly, more comfortable, so that all who are in attendance do not feel agitated or, or that it's disrupting them in any way. Teach all the blessings of Christianity, but you better stay clear of sin and judgment. Better not talk on the need for repentance. These are controversial issues. They divide the church. We need to stay away from them at all costs. And you know what? Churches everywhere were happy to oblige. Were they not? They were happy to give the people what they want. As to not offend anyone. Simply put, we are living in the age of consumer Christianity. This is the American gospel. A watered-down misrepresentation of all biblical truths in an attempt to make it more palatable and more popular for the people. Listen, Christianity light, it tastes great going down, but there's no satisfaction. None. It is hollow. It is worthless. It has no saving power. And there are many people who call themselves Christians who have fallen for this deceptive counterfeit. At one point, they may have said a sinner's prayer, <clears throat> been told that they were good to go, that they were saved, and from that point forward, they just lived their life however they wanted to because they knew they had that ticket punched to get to heaven. Never to contemplate the truths of the gospel ever again. They think they're being rescued from judgment but they're tragically misled. Matter of fact, Paul gives us a strong warning about this in his letter to the Galatian church. He starts off in chapter 1 by giving him this warning, and he repeats it not once, but twice because of the seriousness of what's contained within this warning. Look what he says. He says, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, damned, as we have said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Those are strong words, are they not? Does Paul care about his listeners receiving truth? You better believe it. His heart yearned for the truth of God's word and for the people to be able to receive it accurately. To receive it knowing that it was the center of all that they believed. Paul says, make sure not only what you believe, he said, make sure you believe rightly. Because the consequences are everlasting. There are no do-overs. There are no second chances. When your heart gives its last beat and you are standing in the throne room of God Almighty, you can't say, well, I was misled or I didn't know. Listen, this is the time that we have to make sure what we believe is true to what we are clinging to is right. Heaven and hell, they hang in the balance. 
Now, over the next three weeks, I'm going to ask you to do some serious soul-searching. These are not going to be easy sermons, but they are ones that are desperately needed in the church today. We need to do some introspection as to who we are and in some cases, we need to do some true introspection as to who we really belong to. You see, when Jesus calls us to follow Him, He's comparing the Christian life to a path that you and I must walk. He's calling us. He's calling us to understand what a true disciple looks like. And that's the question I want us to look at over this next three weeks. This is the question I want to continually be ringing through your ears day after day over these weeks. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Not according to the world. Not according to some pastor. Not according to what you're hearing on the radio. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ according to Jesus? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Amen? What does he say a true disciple is? What does it mean to follow him? You see, when we embark on this spiritual journey, on this walk, it requires that we keep in step with him. That we walk daily with him. The road he calls us on is not smooth. It's not easy. It's a dusty path. It's a difficult road that is seldom traveled. Few find it. Contrary to what the world tells you, very few are on this road. And there are many places within the Word of God that give us guidance on what a true disciple looks like. But our focus, our focus is on one specific passage. And we're going to go very carefully through it. And as we saw in John chapter 6 with these vast crowds that were following Jesus, we find the same thing right here in, John, or in Luke 14. Large crowds gathering around Jesus. Many following Him. And for the most part, they gave the very impression of being true disciples. They looked like the real deal. They were excited to be with Him. Go Jesus! Woo! We're right there with you all the way to the end. Wherever you go, we're going to go. We got your back. Wherever Jesus traveled, they were right there. They couldn't get enough of him. But the reality is, most of these people were merely curious about him. Yes, they were excited to see what he would do next. They loved his miracles. They loved his messages. They were intriguing, enlightening. But... They were shallow, superficial, and the Lord Jesus Christ, being the omnipotent, omniscient God, He knew it. He saw right through them. Now Jesus does something with this crowd in this encounter, and it goes against all contemporary church growth models. Completely counter. His actions fly in the face of the seeker-sensitive movement that we see all around us. He stops, he turns around, and he addresses this crowd. And his words are loving, but they are cutting. They are direct. They are given to invoke a response. He gives these words right here in Luke 14 to get the people to think, to wake up, to see what is really going on, what is really important. And they don't make following him easier. No, quite the opposite. These are one of Jesus' harder sayings. Look at verse 26. Luke 14, starting in verse 26. He says, If anyone, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet far way off, a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now what we need to know is these are provocative words, are they not? Extremely provocative words. They're spoken towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. We're about two months from the cross right here, and Jesus is doing his last circuit through the land of Judea. He is heading down. He's probably in the area of Jericho, and, and you got to understand Jericho is 850 feet below sea level. So he is down there at the base. He is preaching these words. He is uh, doing incredible, extraordinary miracles. People are coming to him because they want to see all that he is doing. And this only compounds when he starts making his way back up to Jerusalem for his final triumphant entry. And by the way, Jerusalem is 2,400 feet above sea level. So Jesus is going uphill for, about three, for an elevation change of 3,000 feet on this journey. All these people are following him. They're all excited. He finally gets to Bethany. And if you remember who lives in Bethany, it's his good friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Well, at this point, Lazarus is what? He's dead. Jesus raises it from the dead. What does this do for his crowd? Even more people. Everybody's excited. Matter of fact, this is where he sits on the foal of a donkey. He makes his way, his triumphal entry into the city of David, into Jerusalem. All the people laying down palm branches. Everybody's shouting out, Hosanna! Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're excited. This is all leading to this. It's culminating into this great, this great scene. Right as Jesus comes into the city. But then what happens? It's short-lived, isn't it? Crowds turn on him. He'd be tried, mocked, beaten, crucified on a Roman cross outside the walls of Jerusalem. You see, Jesus Christ would be pierced for our transgressions. He'd be wounded for our iniquity. And being God in the flesh, he knew very well that his time was short. His time was quickly approaching. The hour was at hand. There's no time for pleasantries. Jesus isn't there to pat everybody on the back and say, thank you for following me. No. He understands that this is of the utmost importance of what he is about to tell them. They were meant to cut. They were meant to hit the heart. They were given to get people to think. These are thinking words for the church to make them contemplate the spiritual weight of the subject matter. You see, these words that are given to us right here were given to bring life to spiritually dead men and women. They're given to bring a sinner from the darkness that he once lived in into the light of glory. They're given to place him on a journey that would one day lead to heaven. A journey that starts the moment that we come to a saving faith in Him. But it's also important to understand that our salvation, our salvation has nothing, nothing to do with trying to be a good person. It has nothing to do with being a part of a church. No. Rather, it starts when you surrender your life to Him. That's when this journey begins. And there's absolutely nothing you could do to place yourself on this narrow path. Nothing. There's no moral standard to achieve. There's no rituals to perform. There's no toll for you to pay. There's no spiritual ladder for you to climb. There's absolutely nothing you could do to merit starting this journey with Jesus Christ. It's a gift. Solely a gift. Straight from God. And the only way to enter into this spiritual relationship is through what? Faith. It comes through faith. Just as Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Now, before coming to a knowledge of the truth, you used to walk according to the world, the ways of the world. You acted like the world. You thought like the world. You had been going in the direction of the world. You lived by the Burger King motto. I want to have it my way. You did what you wanted, when you wanted, and you lived for your own pleasures and desires. Am I wrong? We've all been there. We've all been there. You were traveling down the wide road, the broad road that leads to destruction. But then Jesus opened your eyes to see the spiritual need. And you came to Christ by faith. And at that moment, at that moment, when you came to faith and He regenerated your heart and made you His own, He picked you up off of the road, the broad road leading to destruction. And what does He do? He sets you on the narrow path. He sets you on a new road that's going in a completely different direction. One that leads to Him. We're no longer living for ourselves. If you belong to Jesus Christ, who do you live for? Christ. You live for Him. You know, all that you do, your life is Christ, as Paul would later write. You see, following Christ means that we no longer go along with the crowd, but we head down a new path that is headed in a new direction. Just as John tells us in his first letter, 1 John chapter 2, he says, whoever says, I know him, oh yeah, I belong to Jesus. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know, we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in Christ, in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. That's a pretty high calling, isn't it? That's a high standard. That's the standard Jesus Christ demands of his people. He says, you will follow me and you will walk as I walk. You see, when we come to a saving faith in Jesus, not only our thoughts, but our purpose in life is radically changed. We no longer live for our desires, but instead to glorify and honor Christ in all that we say and do. Out of a heart of gratitude for what He has done for us, we set out to live as He lived. And we start to obey the Word of God and we start to follow Jesus. Just as He was here on this earth, we try to live out a life as He lived it, as our example. And we're commanded to love one another as He loved, even those who are difficult to love. We are called to act as He acted and react in the exact same way. We are to walk through this life and endure the trials and the pain just as He did with the supreme confidence in God because we know that He will lead us into the fullness of the blessings of who He is. He has empowered us to live a victory, a life of victory through the Holy Spirit who now lives within us and has sealed us for the day of redemption. The Helper, the Paraclete, who strengthens us hour by hour, day by day. And when we go through hard times, He's there to comfort and sustain us. He's there to challenge us and convict us and to teach us truth. Even when we become complacent, what does the Holy Spirit do? He gives us a good kick sometimes, doesn't He? See, God is going to get us to the finish line because He's empowered us to be able to live this life, to hold us, and through the intimate union that we have with Christ, we have been granted true peace and joy. We share the close fellowship with Him as we draw near to Him daily. But there's another aspect of this journey, and it's less spoken of, but just as important. You see, through the cross, Jesus Christ has paid it all. But following Him comes at a high price. A high price. And the Bible makes it abundantly clear that this is not a relationship that should be entered into lightly. Because following Jesus requires a commitment of all that you are. Coming to Christ demands a full surrender and the highest priority 
He must be his, your highest priority in your life. He has to be everything. Hear me when I say this. Following Jesus Christ is going to cost you much. It will cost you your old way of life. It will cost you a life of ease and living for the world. It'll cost you your old habits, your old associations. It'll cost you your own agenda for this life. It'll cost you your time, your treasure. It'll cost you suffering for being identified with Him. It may even cost you your life, depending on where you live. But in the end, understand, what we gain is so much greater than what we give up. Amen? Is that not the truth? Because it ends in the glories of heaven where Jesus Christ is seated at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father. We know how the story ends. We know when all is said and done that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. But this glory, you need to understand, it is reserved only for those who belong to Him. You see, the vast group of people that we see right here in Luke chapter 14, all of these people that we see here in Luke 14, only a handful, if that, truly understood and had the truth. Only a handful of all of these people. Now, some were committed in this group. Some were genuine, commi genuinely committed to the Lord. They loved Him. They gave up all they had to be with Him. They left behind their old way of life, and they set out to follow Jesus no matter where He took them, no matter where He went. But there were also many who followed Jesus just simply out of curiosity. They were drawn to him because he was different than the religious rulers. He spoke with authority from God himself. As a matter of fact, when the people listened to him, they said, no man has ever spoke like this man. He speaks as God himself. Thus saith the Lord. He was different and the people saw that Jesus was different. But they weren't necessarily convinced by his words. They were skeptical. But then there were others. They were simply confused as to what to believe. Does this Jesus perform the miracles that he does by the power of God? Or does he do them by some other, some other way? Some other spirit? How could the Messiah come out of Galilee? That doesn't make sense. Galilee is full of dirty fishermen. It's full of people who are unclean. There's no way the Messiah would come out of Nazareth. Not only that, we know his mother and father, at least his earthly father. We know his brothers and sisters. They don't even believe in him. How could this man be the Messiah? You see, they were confused and therefore they were uncommitted. Yet others who followed Jesus were intensely religious. When it came to spiritual discretion, they gave their allegiance to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And if they would approve of Jesus, if they would give the green line, say, yep, that's the Messiah, then they would fall right in line. They were waiting for the religious rulers for the Sanhedrin to give the thumbs up saying, yep, that's the man. But they never did that. Matter of fact, they hated Jesus. They wanted nothing to do with him except to put him to death. You see... This group of people claimed to know God. They claimed to be religious, but they were completely and utterly lost. This is perhaps the worst place to be because they were self-deceived into thinking that by opposing Jesus Christ, they were doing good. They thought that they were actually elevating God by putting Jesus down. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, I want us to take this morning and we are going to break down these groups in a more detailed manner because I think there's a lot that we can learn here. And as we do, as we break these groups of people down, I want you to try to identify where you're at. Try to place yourself where you are at in these groups. And again, this is probably one of the most important exercises you will ever do in your entire life. The first group of this large crowd, we're going to call the committed. The committed. They are the ones who were genuinely converted. 
We know that at least 11 of the 12 disciples were, were genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He called them to leave their old, way, old ways behind. He called them onto a new path. He summoned them to leave behind all that was familiar to them. They were no longer to live for themselves, but for Him. And if you remember back in the beginning of the Gospel of John, we were introduced to the first two who followed Jesus. John the Baptist was out by the river with these two disciples. And he sees Jesus coming towards him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and John look at each other and go, Uh, that's probably the man we need to follow. And they start following Jesus. And if you remember, Jesus invited them to stay with him. And in their excitement, in their excitement of finding the Messiah, what did Andrew do? He went out, went out and grabbed Simon Peter. And Simon Peter started following. And then Jesus came and he found Philip. And he brought Philip in and said, follow me. Follow me. And what does Philip do? He goes out and gets his friend Nathaniel. And then later on we find in the book of Matthew that the next one to come along was probably the tax collector, Matthew. And when Matthew, he comes, you've got to understand here, as a tax collector, he was wealthy. It's likely he had an incredible home, all the possessions, everything that came with that job of, of squandering the people's money and stealing from his own, Jewish, his own Jewish people. He was well off. He was hated, but he was well off. So when Jesus calls Matthew to follow him, you've got to understand, what is he giving up? everything. He is giving up his life of luxury. He is giving up all that he knew. He gave up literally everything. There's nothing else. He left it all behind. He left it all behind. Then the rest of the disciples, you have Thomas, Thaddeus, James, the lesser, Simon the zealot, Think about Simon the Zealot. He had to give up, you know, running around wanting to kill the Romans. That's a lot to give up, right? So you have all of these disciples. They willingly gave up what? Everything to follow Jesus Christ. Their livelihoods, their possessions, everything. Like a traveler who comes to the fork in the road, they left the broad path and entered into the narrow gate. They forsake many to join the few. And we're given a similar situation in the Gospel of John where Jesus, again, he has this vast crowd who's following him. And if you remember, he turns to this crowd and gives another one of his hard sayings where he says, those who follow me must eat my flesh and drink my blood or he cannot be my disciple. And his point in that situation was, you must feast on me. I must be your sustenance. I must be your everything. And in that instance... In that situation, what happened to all of the people? They said, this is too much for us to take in. There's no way we could do that. We can't follow you like that. And all the people went away. And they're standing with Jesus, are his 12 disciples. And Jesus looks at them and he says, do you want to go away too? Do you want to leave me too? Do you remember how that conversation ended? Simon Peter, he answered in John 6. He says to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, these are the committed. These are the committed. They are the ones who step out with a decisive faith to follow Jesus Christ wherever He goes. Wherever He leads, they're right there with Him, no matter what it costs no matter what it costs. How about you? How about you? Are you in this small but faithful group? Have you forsaken your old way of life? Have you received the new life that only Jesus offers? Have you decided to follow Christ no matter what it costs you? If so, you're in the right path, leading in the right direction. But there's a second group, 
a second group who were following Jesus that day. We'll call them the curious. The curious. They were undoubtedly following Jesus for all the amazing signs and wonders that he was performing, intrigued by the words that he spoke. They heard rumors that he could possibly be the, the Messiah. But they needed to check it out for themselves. They wanted to know if this was really true. And because of this, many people started following him. This would probably make up the largest segment of this crowd, I'm sure. And if you jump forward 2,000 years, there are many people today just like him. They're interested in Jesus because he is the central figure of all of history. He is the one who taught amazing truths. He spoke as no man has ever spoke. And they see the ministries serving the needs of the people within these churches who claim to know him. And they love celebrating Christmas and Easter. Who doesn't like celebrating Christmas and Easter after all, right? However, these inquisitive individuals have never committed their lives to Jesus. They're simply part of a crowd going down the road with him. I wonder if this group possibly describes you. You know, there has to be a lot more to this life than what we see. There has to be. More than you have experienced. Maybe you're here this morning and you sense, you sense that emptiness within your soul. The void. Because all these years, all you've had is religion. You've gone to church out of religiosity. But not because of a love relationship with Christ. Christ. Maybe the reality of death and how quickly it's approaching has made you contemplate the vastness of eternity and what will happen when you come face to face with the living God. Friend, if this group describes you, you should give extreme, careful consideration to Jesus' words right here. Because He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. He alone can lead you safely to heaven. Do you know Him or do you simply know of Him? It's an important question. There's a third group we must address and we're going to call them the confused. The confused. Those who couldn't make up their minds about who Jesus was and they were confused simply in the ability to be able to comprehend and understand that he was more than a man. They couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus was divine. After all, he looked like an ordinary man. For 30 years, what did Jesus work as? A carpenter. So by all outside perspective, they're thinking, okay, we know this man from Nazareth. Again, we know his family. We know what he has done as a carpenter. How could he be the Son of God? And because of this, they were confused. They were confused as to what to believe. Not to mention they couldn't figure out the fact why he came into the world in the first place. Now, this group, they did believe that Jesus was a good teacher. They loved his teaching. He should be a man that would be emulated for the spiritual truths that he taught. But he was not to be worshipped. No, that's a step too far. You see, the Pharisees had taught these people that only those who do the works of the law would be saved. Only those who lived a really good, upright life are going to be seen uh, right in God's presence. They must keep the law in order to gain favor with God because it was given to them it was given to them to somehow bring them into this, into this life, but they had completely missed the fact of the, of the gospel, or not the gospel, of the law. They have missed the fact of why the law was given. Why was the law given? It was given to shine a bright light on what? Our sin. It was given to us to show us that we are incapable of keeping it. It was given to show their need for a Savior. That's why the law, that's why the Tenth Commandments was given to us. To show us that we're unworthy. And the only thing we're worthy of is death. 
Matter of fact, we're told this in Galatians chapter 3. Look what Paul writes. He says, Now before faith came, before the gospel came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith, until the coming of the gospel would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified again by what? Faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. And what is the guardian? The law. We are no longer under the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. You see, these men and women, they thought that they were making themselves right in God's sight by observing the law and trying to be good. That somehow this was meriting something for them. That they were pleasing God with their good deeds. So blind were these people to their sinful condition. They had no understanding of who they really were in relation to a holy God. And there are many people in our day who think exactly like these people. You know that? They may not put their trust in the law per se, but they think that as long as they live a good life and do the best they can, I was sharing the gospel. I had the opportunity to share the gospel with a, uh, a man yesterday. And I asked him if you were to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he asked you, why should I let you into this heaven? And, and his answer, he, he grew up Catholic. And his answer was, well, I've tried to live a good life. And, you know, I think God will let me in because I've tried to live a good life. That's the standard answer in this world. You know that? It's the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer. You see... The logical question that we need to ask. How do I enter in? How do I enter in? Because our goodness is not enough. You see, when Jesus was teaching his Sermon on the Mount, he set the standard for entrance into heaven. Do you remember what that standard was? Matthew 5, 48. Jesus turned to the people and said, Oh, by the way, be perfect is my Father in heaven is perfect. Where did he set the standard? High. An impossible standard. An impossible standard. What is the standard for salvation? Perfection. Absolute moral flawlessness. And no one is capable of achieving that goal. And those who think that somehow their good deeds are going to put them over the finish line, they're deceived. Extremely deceived. Just as the Apostle Paul made it abundantly clear in Galatians 3.10. He says, For all who rely on the works of the law for their good deeds are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You see, the people in this group fail to see their complete unworthiness. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understand. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet they cling to this false hope that somehow that God grades on this curve and that somehow they're going to be found just on the other side of it. They might just squeak into heaven from their good works. Beloved, that's not in the Bible. That's completely counter to what Scripture tells us. And if you're sitting here this morning and you have this mindset... You're just hoping and praying that somehow you'll make it in. If you were to do an honest examination of your heart, does this view describe you? Are you somehow just hoping that your goodness is going to get you there? If you do, God's Word declares you are cursed. You're cursed. Because your good deeds will never get you there. Ever. Understand, God only saves those who recognize they are unworthy and deserve nothing but death. Those who come to Him who are spiritually bankrupt. Those are the ones who God saves. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Are you in this group? Are you in this group? There's a fourth group of people in this crowd, and we're going to call them the convicted seekers. The convicted seekers. 
Now this group was genuine and wanting to know more about Christ and what was required of salvation. They had heard him preach. They were processing everything that he had proclaimed. And his words convicted their hearts because they knew that they weren't right with God. They knew that they were sinful in need of redemption. They were empty inside. And this emptiness prompted them to follow Jesus. They had heard his invitation to follow him, but they weren't yet quite ready to go all in. They were right there on the border, but they just could not step over the line. They had come to the crossroads of life, but they were unwilling to commit. Why were they hesitant? Because they were unable to give up their old ways. And sadly, this is where many people stand today. Perhaps even you. You know that whatever you've experienced at this point, it hasn't been the real thing. You may have fooled yourself. You may have fooled those around you. But deep down, you know. You know it's not real. And John gives us the reason why in his first letter, 1 John 2. He says, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of what? The world. John's point is simple. You want to be known as a Christian. You want to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. But you love the things of the world. Because they hold preeminence in your heart. Yet you recognize the haunting conviction of your sin that never goes away and you know, you know you need forgiveness. You know you need it. You might find yourself sitting in the pew every Sunday, but you have yet to commit fully to Christ. You may even hang out with a religious crowd. Maybe part of a small group Bible study. Have all the Christian, Christianese and the Christian lingo down to a T. But within your heart, you know that you're not a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you've yet to surrender your life to Him. And because of that, you have never become an authentic, true, born-again follower. Friend, if you were to do some deep introspection into your life, does this describe where you're at right now? Is this you? Is this you? These are important questions. They don't get any more important. This is eternity. This is life after death where it goes on forever and ever and ever. We have to be real where we're at. We have to do a heart check. Does Jesus Christ know me as his own? There's one last category. One last category. They hung around with Jesus. And I think this one's the most tragic. And by all outside appearances, they look like the real deal. They spoke with the right words. They're quite good at masking their spiritual void. They walked in close proximity to Jesus. They even traveled with him right by his side. But the reality is they were not authentic believers, but rather men and women who were caught up in the excitement of the moment. This group could be labeled the counterfeits. The counterfeits. They had an empty testimony. They knew about Jesus, but they did not belong to Jesus. There was one man in particular, and he felt very comfortable in this group. His name was Judas. He was one of the twelve. He ate and drank with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was privy to sit under the private instruction of Jesus and observe firsthand the integrity of his life. He was witness to countless miracles. He sat under his teachings privately with the twelve, with the other eleven. He heard these amazing truths. He watched as countless people had their lives transformed by his supernatural power. And as a matter of fact, Judas, Judas was so well respected. He was so well received. 
as a true disciple. What did the other disciples do? They made him the treasurer of the group. They gave him control of all the finances. So by all outside accounts, this man looked like the real deal. But in his heart, he had never died to himself. It was all about him, his selfish interest. Listen, Judas had no desire to live a sold-out life for Christ. None. As a matter of fact, when the situation presented itself, he sold Jesus out for how many pieces of silver? 30 pieces of silver. And we're told in Luke chapter 22, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and a man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Three years he was with Jesus. Three years in intimate fellowship, or at least walking side by side with the Lord. And tragically, Judas remained on the outside of the kingdom of God. He had become so skilled at looking like a true believer that no one noticed his hypocrisy. He even fooled himself. And again, I ask you, does this describe you? Does this describe you? Perhaps you think yourself as a Christian, but maybe could it be that you're not? Maybe you've been baptized at some point in your life. Maybe you've said a sinner's prayer sometime in your past. But deep down, could it be that you have never truly surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Friend, you need to understand that surrendering your life to Him is not an option into the kingdom of heaven. It is a requirement. This is not me saying this. This is the Lord declaring this over and over and over. Enter through the narrow gate. Enter through. Strive for the narrow gate, the narrow path. It cannot be, bad, it cannot be bypassed. Could it be you're self-deceived in your relationship with God? Understand, there are countless people who have lived under this false delusion regarding their spiritual state only to die and wake up to the eternal realities of hell. For ages upon ages, they will have to contemplate what could have been. And Jesus warned us about this deception. He made it very clear there are many who are deceived. Look what he writes in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Jesus, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, don't miss that word, on that day, how many? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, there's emphatic, there's an emphatic nature to what he's saying here. This is people who have claimed to be Christians. This is people who have claimed to walk with him their whole life, perhaps. You see that emphatic nature right there? Lord, Lord, we know you. We went to church. We did all these things. We went to Bible studies. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then comes the words which will echo for eternity in their ears. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Beloved, I love you. I don't ever want you to hear those words. Those are haunting words. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of what? Lawlessness. Does Christ know you? Are you part of his flock? Are you a child of God? Luke 14, 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Do Jesus' words this morning offend you? If they do, 
you very likely need to reassess where you're at. Beloved, this may not, a, may not be a popular message in today's world. And this is not a gospel being preached in the majority of ch the churches across the country today. Instead, it is a man-centered, watered-down message that has no saving power. But this is the high calling of the gospel. This is the true gospel, not the American gospel. This is the true gospel. You need to come to Christ on His terms. You need to surrender your life to Him on His terms. I ask you, is He the highest priority in your life? Is Jesus Christ your greatest possession, your greatest treasure of everything in this world? Is He your everything? You need to understand He has to be your first love. He will not take second place. He won't. He must be your everything. And as a messenger of the gospel, it is my highest responsibility to make sure that you are ready to meet your God. But you also need to understand it's your responsibility to believe and be saved. You see, these are the same categories of people today who are going down the road with Jesus Christ. The committed, the curious, the confused, the convicted, and the counterfeits. But it is imperative that each one of us asks ourselves, where do I see myself this morning? Which category am I in? Only you can answer that. I can't. Only you know, oh, and God knows. Paul gave us a strong warning in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Take these words to heart. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or you do not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We are called to do a self-examination to make sure we are truly in Christ. Now in the medical world, it's said that having a proper diagnosis is half of the cure. And I think the same could be said of the spiritual realm. It is absolutely imperative that you have a correct diagnosis of, of where you stand with Christ. You must know where you are before you can know what you need and what you need to do. And if you're here this morning and you know that you are not right with the King, I plead with you to come before Him and get right. Surrender your life to Him. Acknowledge that you are bankrupt, that you are empty. There's nothing you could do to save yourself. Come to Him and plead for mercy and forgiveness. Go all in. Go all in with Him. There's nothing more important. There's no greater thing we could ever do in this life. Understand, we receive Jesus Christ simply by faith. We receive Him simply by faith and we come to the cross empty-handed knowing there's absolutely nothing that we could do to save ourselves. We simply come to Him understanding that we are sinners in need of a Savior crying to Him, please save me. And He promises to do just that. Surrender your life to Him as Lord and Savior. Ask Him to make you into a new creation. Jesus gave us this promise in John 5, 24. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. No matter where you're at in this life, Jesus' words, they are intended for you. They're for you. Now, we only covered the first few words in this passage, but over the next few weeks, we are going to really break this down because they are words that we need to hear. They are not words we normally hear, but we need to hear them. We're going to look at and analyze what is required of a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. And to prepare you beforehand, He doesn't mince His words. 
what Jesus says will challenge the faith of every authentic disciple. And we need to be challenged. We need to be grown. Amen? And until then, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. It hits us and it hits me, Lord. And I pray for anyone here who has never given their life to you, but this would be the day that they would recognize their spiritual condition, that they have not gone all in with you, Lord Jesus, and that they will come to the foot of the cross empty-handed, begging for mercy, knowing that you receive all who come to you in faith, who have a genuine heart of repentance. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that that's exactly what they will do. They will see their need and come to you. For those of us, Lord Jesus, who belong to you, I pray that we do some deep introspection this week, that we look at our walk, the things that we have placed before you, and we remove them, we cast them out of our lives so that we can live a life dedicated and sold out for you. We thank you for your sacrifice on that cross. You gave it all so that we could live. You gave it all so that we could be forgiven. We, that we could be children of the Most High God, receiving every inheritance in the heavenlies. Lord, you have done so much, and we worship you. We praise you, and we thank you. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to see where we're at so that we can repent so we could change where we are going and turn and follow you wholly to love you, Lord, to the best of our abilities in this fallen flesh, to serve you and to honor you. How we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you are doing. This church, we love you and we surrender this all to you and give it all to you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together as we respond, singing, Yet not I, but Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless praise. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.
the price it has made paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave for the disciple my sin has been defeated sermon was presented to you by Pathway Christian of Harlan. If you are in any way encouraged by this message or would like to know more, we would love to hear from you. Please visit our website at pathwaychristianharlan.com or you can reach out by calling our office at 260-234-8571 or by mail at 12732 Spencerville Road, Harlan, Indiana 46743. Until next time here at Pathway, God bless.